those of you who aren't from First Baptist, I'm the Minister of Pastoral Care here. We just really, really appreciate you coming, especially you coming from outside churches. Um, this is a really important, uh, vital gospel conversation, and we really appreciate that you understand that and want to be part of the cultural shift um, to better take care of vulnerable populations, especially those who have been abused by the church. I also wanted to recognize uh, Stephanie and Kara Davis, who are outside manning our book table. Um, they are the directors of Women at First, and without them, this wouldn't be happening. This is part of a uh, series of seminars and discussions and workshops that they've been putting on for the last year in a series titled, Who's My Neighbor? So this was a series to address uh, who are those people, uh, those vulnerable populations that were so close to Jesus' heart, who we have been called to... Um, to love in a very unique, intentional way, to make sure that they understand um, how loved they are, how beloved they are by God, and uh, that um, just to be approached in a way that is more uh, respectful and dignified than the church historically has done. And, um, you know, they've gotten a little bit of grief for these subject matters that we've been doing. We've been doing foster care and refugee care. Um, we've uh, done a seminar on sex trafficking, domestic abuse. And there have been some people in the church who have said, you know, why, why do we keep covering these topics, these difficult topics? These don't apply to us. Um, why can't you just keep doing bunko and, and cookie decorating? Um, but to the outside world, this is what's important, and they're looking to us to see how we're going to be responding to these issues. They're wondering why we're not talking about them more, especially an issue like church abuse, where we're, we are the source of that harm, and we've been so silent for so long. So that, uh, the shift is starting to change. We're starting to see uh, survivors not as uh, people who are trying to remove the focus from our gospel message, but we're starting to see them as prophets who are bringing the light into these dark places, no matter where they're found, even if, if the, uh, the abusers and the perpetrators are our church leaders, our beloved people in our communities. These are conversations we have to have. So um, I'm very honored to introduce Mike Sloan to you. He works with um, Grace, which is a godly response to abuse in the church. And when we first started talking about having this seminar, we knew we wanted to have Grace involved because they do such a wonderful job of education, but not only that, but they're so well respected within the survivor community. And they are fantastic advocates for them. They don't hold the churches, and they make sure that they do shine that light wherever the darkness is found. So Mike has flown all the way from Lynchburg, Virginia today. And uh, I'm just going to hand the mic over to him, and you've got a little help. No, no, yes, no, I will not. No, I will no, hand no. it this way to the stand. <laughs> and so before he does get started, I'm sorry, just some logistical things for those of you who aren't familiar with this building. Restrooms are to the left. We do have a book table resources, and at some point at a natural break, we will be taking a break where we have snacks and coffee in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I, just so you know where I'm coming from, I am a son of the church. I grew up in the church. I love the church. In my church growing up, we did all the normal church things. We had sermons about Jesus, and we talked about personal forgiveness of sins and good news for sinners. And yet, one of the conversations we didn't have very often was that conversation that was alluded to about abuse in the church. And now it's a pleasure of mine, after having gone into pastoral ministry for many years and seeing how churches can make such a huge difference in this area, to now work full time with Grace and train churches, equip churches to understand the deeper cultural issues that must be addressed, along with the very practical details of prevention within churches. So today, uh, again, Grace is an organization, we train churches around the world, we have um, helped hundreds of churches uh, with training, with policy consultation, and often we're receiving calls for consultation when churches are dealing with any and all different forms of abuse. So on a weekly basis, we're interacting with churches who are dealing with abuse in real time, whether that's the abuse of a child or domestic violence or abuse involving uh, someone on their staff, uh, even a pastor. So we're uh, helping churches, advising churches in those situations uh, all the time, and so we have a, a unique perspective and experience in that area, and we're glad to use that to help bring these issues into the light for churches. And so just a little bit more about my story is that I went into pastoral ministry after seminary, 
And I didn't have from my seminary the tools and education I needed to understand abuse and what it takes to actually prevent abuse in the church, to actually name it properly and respond well when it does come to light. So that's one of the reasons, thankfully, I received some training soon after I entered ministry. And I tried to read everything I could. I tried to <coughs> get as much training as I could. And eventually I ran into the Ministry of Grace. And our, our current director is Boz Chavijan, who founded Grace in 2004. And eventually I got to a place where I was involved with Grace and working with Grace and now transitioned to working full time for Grace, uh, traveling around the country, training and helping churches. And when we're doing well in the church, often we have some good policies in place. We've got some background checks in place for our volunteers and our staff, and that's all well and good. And yet those in and of themselves are not enough to affect the deeper culture change that's needed. And so really what today is our focus is going to be on is what is it going to take to bring that deeper culture change to our churches and face this reality, not with, you know, not with half measures. What is it going to take to really make a long-term difference? Now that's not going to be an easy task, of course, but if we're going to make a difference in the next generation, what are the things that we really need to work on and focus on? So that's what we're going to do today. Because of our, the heaviness of our topic, I'm really going to encourage you to practice self-care. I'm going to encourage you to practice self-care after our time today, this afternoon. You're going to be seeing the resources, and you're going to, you're going to reference some books and, and individuals who are experts on this matter. You're going to be like, I want to go watch that documentary. I want to go read this book. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Take a break. You have to pace yourself. We're human beings. And even if in this room, I know we have survivors in this room. And by the way, no one's going to be put on the spot if you're a survivor. Uh, I will ask for interaction at points, but that's all going to be voluntary. And absolutely, I'm not going to ask anyone to share their story. Uh, so that's something that all survivors should be able to do when they're ready, uh, when they feel safe and are ready to tell someone that they trust. <coughs> However, so afterward, self-care, and of course self-care is just anything we do to care for ourselves. It's not spending a lot of money. Uh, it's simply taking a walk or listening to some music that is refreshing to us or taking our medication or getting some sleep, uh, eating something we like. You know, those sorts of things are... Uh, self-care and just taking time to process what you're hearing today with someone you trust um, probably not right after as I said give it a few days but come back to that and process that with someone you trust and uh, <coughs> that is really going to help you uh, and even during our time this morning please practice self-care so as already been mentioned we will take breaks but I would encourage you at any point during our time, if you just need to stand up and stretch, move around, get a drink of water or some more coffee, again, please move around. Uh, that's absolutely vital. And I'm even going to give you some exercises uh, a little bit later on that are trauma-informed that you can do uh, and, and, and practice. Uh, whether or not you're a survivor, there is such a thing as vicarious trauma. And so whenever you talk about things that are intense and heavy or traumatic, uh, again, there's no way for that not to impact us in our bodies, in our brains, in our souls. So I encourage you to, to take that very seriously. All right, let's start with something very concrete, a very concrete scenario. And I am going to ask for your participation if you're, if you're ready, ready to jump in. Let me just lay out a scenario that could happen in your church or mine, in any given church in the USA. Let's imagine this scenario. Let's say it's Wednesday night activities and things are kind of winding down and most people have headed out for the evening. And if you don't have Wednesday night um, activities, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is Oklahoma. I live in the Bible Belt, in Virginia. Um, okay, but just imagine, if, if that's not your churches, how, and I know we have a few other churches visiting, Sunday night or whatever, just fill in the, fill in the blank that, in a scenario that makes sense to you. So let's say there's only a few people left in the foyer milling around, and let's say Kate is there, who's 13. Kate loves her church, by the way. She loves going to church, and it's a lifeline for her right now, because her parents are going through a divorce. And so the, the, the nourishment spiritually, the relationships, 
the place of the sense of belonging that she gets has taken on that much more added importance to her in these last few months. But mom is actually late tonight to pick her up. And her youth pastor looks at her and says, hey Kate, can you come to my office for a second? I have a book I want to give you. What do you think Kate's going to do if her youth pastor says that? Does she trust him? Of course she does. And she starts walking off with him. Now, let me just pause for a second and tell you about this youth pastor. This youth pastor's been to his denomination seminary, uh, one of their seminaries. He's been trained. He is an amazing youth pastor to the, to the families of this church. He gives amazing Bible teaching. Uh, he teaches them this good news about Jesus. He has these parents so excited because guess who likes going to church in this, in this scenario? The kids just love coming to church and being a part of this. They feel, again, like they belong. And so who's happy about this situation? Mom and dad are really happy. You know, parents are really happy about the situation. Who else is happy about the situation, by the way? The other staff members at the church. Hey, here's our colleague pulling their weight, you know, <laughs> bringing in families into our church's ministry. That's all wonderful. That's good, right? Okay, now, as they walk away from everyone else, no one kind of noticed. No one noticed. And as they're walking down the hallway, a young mom passes them. And this young mom rushed in to get a coloring paper of a pirate ship that her five-year-old had colored and then left in the building. And now her five-year-old's world is falling apart. <laughs> and justice in the universe will not be restored until she gets this coloring paper and gets it back to its rightful owner. Now, what does a five-year-old need at 7.30 on a Wednesday night. Uh, sleep, maybe some food, uh, some snuggles and hugs before bed, right? To, to feel safe and, and, and secure. Okay, all of those things are needed. And guess where that mom's mind is probably? It's on those things. And yet she passes Kate and the youth pastor walking down the hallway. Now here's the question for you to consider. What needs to be in place in this church in order for prevention to happen in this situation. An adult is isolating a child. This is not a safe situation. We want to have in our policies no one-on-one -on -one adult child situations. That's kind of a minimal standard, according to child protection experts. So what would need to be in place for, the, for that to actually, for prevention to actually occur in this, in, in this scenario? What, what are, there's many things. And I'm just curious, what are some of the first things that come to your mind in that regard? What would you say? Well, at least my volunteer needs to stay with the other adult <clears throat> until all the kids are gone. Okay, right. So we need some awareness on behalf of the volunteers or whoever's in charge of the kids, the youth pastor, of course. So we need some, what, what, what could we call that? Policy. We need education. What, what else do we need? Policies. Policy. Okay, good. What else? Accountability. Okay, accountability. And well, awareness. Okay, awareness. <laughs> I, I think cameras. <laughs> okay. Well, here's the thing about cameras. <laughs> who's watching the cameras? Yeah. The question is, who's watching? And often the answer is <coughs> nobody. <laughs> And it's usually something, it's not actually a tool for, for prevention. No, it's a deterrent. It's a deterrent, and sadly, it often gives us a false sense of security, right. too often. Okay, and often it's only responding to something that happened in the past. Okay, but here in our scenario, this church, by the way, because this is my scenario, I'm going to tell you what's going on. This church actually has in their policy, hey, if, unless it's your child, we, we don't allow any one adult in the situation. <coughs> our policy. Guess where that policy is? It's in a filing cabinet. It's in the church office. And guess who's read that policy? Well, yeah, some, sometimes the answer is nobody. And sometimes the answer is, if churches are doing actually uh, better than others, a lot of churches, what, who, is, who has read the policy? The staff. And maybe who? The volunteers who work with the youth or the kids, right? Um, now, this young mom who's gone to receive the pirate ship coloring paper, has she read the policy? She doesn't work in the nursery at the church or work with the two and three-year-old class or the youth group. 
What are the odds that she's read that policy in most churches? Close to zero. Close to zero. Yeah. So do you see that we need to have some mentality shifts? What does, where does training often go? To the staff and the volunteers. And where do the policies apply mostly? They apply mostly for what kind of contexts? Sunday school, children's worship, the youth group hour. But are we in the youth group hour right now? No, that's over. And we're just walking down the hallway at church. We're just hanging out. We're just going to get a book. So what does, okay, beyond that, this mom would need to say something and notice, and hopefully others would have noticed before now, but let's say we're just talking about her. She would have to have training, awareness, education, and know the policy. But beyond that, what else would she need? And it was, there's one answer right here that was said, accountability. Let's think about that in terms of the church culture. What needs to be in place in that church culture for her to feel comfortable intervening? Because what is the, what is the dynamic between her and that youth pastor? What, is, what, kind of, what kind of power and influence does that youth pastor have in this church? Does he have spiritual authority? He has a spiritual position. He has spiritual authority. He has emotional power. Of course, he has physical power over Kate, right? But beyond that, the more uh, in the church, the more potent forms of power are often those spiritual and emotional forms of power, right? And so what might be going through her head? Oh, I don't want to say anything to him. Why not? Why not? Well, why would she... <coughs> Why would she, in her mind, why would she accuse him of something? That is, is she being yeah. uh, a bad person or whatever? I don't know the right word. Yeah. Is, is there something that's, what's the matter with her mind that she could think something bad about them? Right. And, and, and it's not a matter of bad, it's a matter of good practices versus right. good practices. So in her mind, maybe she's thinking, well, I don't want to accuse anybody of abuse. But is that what's happening when we enforce a boundary? When we intervene and say, hey, this is the boundary of our policy, and we need to uphold this, are we, are we gossiping? No, that's not gossip. Are we accusing someone of abuse? No, we're not, that's not what, and so to make those distinctions, we need to have leaders step up and empower everyone to clarify what's happening. First of all, to dial down the anxiety and ratchet it down a little bit, and say, when you enforce a boundary, you're not calling someone an abuser. You're simply enforcing a boundary that is important to the safety of those who are vulnerable. And there needs to be express permission from leaders within a church culture, I find, for everyone to feel comfortable intervening, especially when there's such a power difference. And in this case, we have a real power difference. This youth pastor is incredibly influential in this church because of his ministry. And so if anyone is going to hold him accountable, someone with much less power, there needs to be an equally or greater culture of accountability within that church. Okay, so do you see, just with this little 10-minute scenario, actual prevention is a little harder than it first seems. It's not quite as easy as just making sure, hey, we've got a policy in our filing cabinet, we've got our background checks done. There's actually all sorts of dynamics, and we've only mentioned a few here, and so we're going to continue to work through some of those, but that's good. That'll set the scene. What churches need to do is think about abuse systemically. Of course, many of us are aware of the, the well-publicized case of Larry Nassar, who abused hundreds, literally hundreds, of young girls and women, young women, in USA Gymnastics and in Michigan State. And I came across this article at the time when he was being sentenced, and so many survivors <coughs> were speaking so powerfully at his sentencing, uh, I just found this quote incredibly powerful, that Nasser will die in prison is a little comfort, because the systems that allowed him to survive and thrive for so many years remain very much alive. And did you hear that? Some of you heard and listened to some of those survivor testimonies at his sentencing. Did you catch that dynamic that many of them highlighted? It's one thing to hold one abuser accountable. It's a whole other deal to address within a, within a system the things that didn't work. 
that enable him for years. And that's a totally different, you know, that's a, this is good. We're glad Larry's going to jail, so many of them said. But we also need to think, how can Michigan State do better? How can USA Gymnastics do better? And of course, it's easy for us to pull that example out, but what do we need to do? As Christians, what do we need to do? How do we in the church need to do better? What needs to be in place within our church systems? And abuse experts, by the way, have been saying this for years, way before Larry Nasser. <laughs> Dr. Anna Salter is a pioneer in this field. She's been saying this for years, and we need to listen to her. She said, look, offenders can recognize ideal settings. And, and you know, she's highlighting child molesters, but that's true of any kind of abuser. Uh, it's true for those who abuse their spouses. It's true of those who, within a church, are, are a pastor, they're a pastor who abuse others, whether it's another adult or a child. Uh, and certainly that's true of child abusers. Uh, this is what abuse experts have been doing <coughs> for years. And this should cause us uh, a lot of <laughs> consternation as Christians. And this is a quote from a pastor who abused dozens of children in his own church. I consider church people easy to fool. They have a trust that comes from being Christians. So again, this is something that I did not have the tools I needed growing up and then in seminary. And now this is something we must face. We have to reckon with these dynamics. And here's the good news. When churches listen and humble themselves and get better education and training, we can be a huge part of the solution. So I want you to leave here as much bad news as we're going to hear today, and there's going to be plenty of it. We're going to also leave here and do our very best to remain encouraged because churches can make a tremendous difference. I have had the opportunity in my work to see some horrible things up close, but I've also been able to see some of the most amazing people you will ever meet who are incredibly committed to protecting the vulnerable. So here's our roadmap for this morning, after that introduction. Today we're going to talk about three keys for culture change in the church. And notice these things are not uh, things like background checks, and um, do your background checks. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. Do your background checks. Call and check those references when you hire a pastor. Absolutely do it. But the things that really drive the engine of culture change are going to be things that are not so tangible. It's going to be humility and empathy and courage. Let me just tell you just a quick little story. Uh, my wife and I have five children, and before our third child was born, God made it possible we got to go away for just a few days to San Diego for a vacation and just have some time away together. And we ended up, we planned the church, and, I mean the trip a few months out, but by the time we got there, kind of like what's happening now, there was a whole lot of wildfires in the area. So this is several years ago. And we weren't, uh, several things in the city actually <coughs> closed when we were there. Uh, we got to see a lot of things. But we went to the famous park in San Diego, Balboa Park, one day. And we went to the History Museum because the Dead Sea Scroll exhibit was there. And we wanted to see that. But we couldn't find out online if it was open. <coughs> and so we kind of walked up in this beautiful building with these amazing glass doors, and there's a little gap in the front door, and there was an attendant standing there, and we came up to see if it was open, and there was a family standing in front of us, mom and dad and two kids, and the mom is furious, because the attendant, we can now as we kind of sneak up and right behind and listen to this conversation, we understand now that, oh, they're closed, and they're not gonna be open today, and the mom is just laying into this attendant and saying, we drove from Wisconsin and we are here to see the Dead Sea Scrolls and we want to, and she's just letting her have it. And so my wife and I are just kind of standing in the back awkwardly, like, okay, let's just get out of here. But I'll never forget what the attendant said to her. She was so kind, she was so polite, and she said, ma'am, I am so sorry but the city is on fire. <laughs> Ma'am, I'm so sorry, but the city is on fire. And to me, it's this amazing illustration of what is going on right now in the church. So you have people in the church who are not acknowledging that there's something really, really wrong. 
and it's all around us if we will simply listen and pay attention. And so that, uh, that family and the, the mom and how she was laying into the attendant, to me it just reminds me of, of you know, entitlement and just a lack of empathy and a lack of consideration to understand what's, because she wasn't personally being affected by it. She wasn't caring or aware. She wasn't self-aware of what was going on around her, right? And so she, there was an arrogance in that and a self-absorption. And really that's the key, is that we have to understand, we have to start by listening. And that culture change is, is really hard work to acknowledge there's something seriously wrong and to take steps to address it is key. So let's start with humility. And humility for me just starts with listening. We have to start by listening to survivors. Uh, there are so many in our day and age survivors who have been uh, so courageous to come forward and tell their stories. And for us to listen to them and take their stories seriously is so critical to culture change. We have to listen to experts on abuse like Dr. Anna Salter and her work that she's done. We have to listen to Lundy Bancroft who worked with husbands mostly and partners who were violent uh, for 15, 20 years. And so he has learned a tremendous amount. We need to listen to experts like Lundy Bancroft. And we need to listen as Christians to Jesus who said so many powerful things about wolves among the sheep. He talked about abuse a lot in his ministry, and the scripture speaks so powerfully <coughs> to these dynamics. So let's just take a second. And so we need to learn, we need to listen to scriptures, we need to learn from experts, we need to listen to the scriptures. And so let's just take this next few minutes and listen and think carefully and think more deeply about abuse. So what is abuse? Abuse is not a sin like other sins. Abuse is a particularly egregious type of sin because abuse always involves someone with some kind of power using that power over someone who is more vulnerable. And it's typically someone not just with any kind of power, it's a power that's related to trust. It's a power where someone is trusted and known. In almost any form of abuse, the person is known. That's, and so here in the scriptures, here's a verse that kind of brings this out. Uh, it's a lament. It's, to, it's crying out to God with this heartfelt sorrow over the situation and over the amount of abuse in the world and oppression in the world. It says, again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed. They had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. So do you see? It's highlighting what is the situation in any kind of oppression, exploitation, or abuse. Someone has power. They're using that power over another to violate, to harm. And beyond this, the other common dynamics that we always see with abuse are deception, and using someone as if they're taking a person, a human being, made in God's image, created to be respected and created with inherent dignity and worth, dehumanizing them and objectifying them and using them like an object to be disposed of. So there's always some sort of dehumanization, objectification. And of course, there's that dynamic of keeping it secret, keeping it hidden, using deception, and there's other common dynamics in most cases of abuse. <coughs> Often abusers work to isolate their victims, whether that's in order to abuse them or to keep them away from people who could help them and interrupt the abuse. And of course, there's always a dynamic of fear and keeping the victim silent and in fear and in terror. And when confronted, if the abuser is ever confronted, of course, the common dynamics are always denial and further manipulation, further deception, and often attacking any attempts to hold them accountable. And then you have other tactics like deflecting attention, excusing what they've done, and blaming who? Blaming the victim is very common, but really blaming anything else. Well, I just had this alcohol issue. 
I'm just under so much stress from my work. Uh, I'm just I'm dealing with so much right now in my marriage, and then I acted out in this way with this other with this child. You know, you, you hear it all, uh, and those are you know tactics that'll change depending because offenders will always change the tactic to gauge whether it will work with you. And so they'll just change their tactic over and over and over again. That's one of the ways you know you're dealing with someone who's not really seriously repentant at all, is if they're changing tactics and you know they're dangerous, uh, if you see that going on. Uh, one other dynamic that's worth mentioning that you'll hear a lot about is something we call now uh, grooming. Uh, grooming is very difficult to, uh, to teach and say, this is what grooming is, or this is what it looks like, because it's a, first of all, um, it's, it's a constellation of innocent appearing behaviors. It's not the behavior in and of itself that's alarming. Like giving a gift to a child is not alarming <coughs> in and of itself. And by the way, most people who give gifts to children are, are not abusers, um, just so you know. But do abusers use that sometimes as a grooming technique? Sure. Uh, most people who give hugs to kids or touch kids in some way are not abusers. But do abusers use touch in certain ways to groom children? Yes. Uh, it, again, it's much more nuanced than you would think. It's not so much the behavior itself, it's how it's being used. And, of course, it allows them to have access to the victim. It's keeping them trapped in the abuse and hidden from others. But for our purposes this morning, <coughs> just so you know, here's the important thing. For us in the church, grooming is not only directed at victims. It's also directed at anyone who has care of the child. So parents, uh, volunteers who care for kids, you know, teachers, anyone who would have. Uh, and then with other forms of abuse like domestic violence, grooming is very much directed at friends who would possibly be able to help the person. Or, you know, the pastor. Many uh, women in religious communities are not comfort as comfortable going to an outside organization like a, a shelter to get advice or help if they're in a, a, an abusive marriage or relationship. But many of them would first go to their pastor. And so abusers know this and they groom the pastor to try to cut off any kind of help that would be given. And then in general, it's also directed toward the whole community. And so this is something we must reckon with in churches is that this is how abuse works, whether it's you know, a, a domestic violence situation, a child abuser, or a pastor who's abusing his power in some way in the church. There is always grooming of the whole community, typically. And this is something that makes it so difficult to respond well, and that's the whole point. They do it so you can't, you're caught off guard, you're disarmed, you don't see what's really happening and then if something do, is concerning that comes to light, are you going to be as likely to respond appropriately? The whole point of the grooming is that you're then disabled and disarmed from responding appropriately. Now all of this is based not only on what experts teach today, but it's also based in things that Jesus taught 2,000 years ago. Jesus said this, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So, He's talking here about predatory people, <laughs> wolves. And he says, because there is this reality of predatory people, you know, the innocent as doves, don't, don't partake in that. That's not what Christians are called to, to how we're called to live. But he says we are to be wise as serpents. This is essentially what abuse experts teach today. It's a precisely our lack of knowledge that gives predators their edge. She, an assaulter here is saying, look, we have to get smarter. <laughs> We have to understand what this is and what's going on. Well, Jesus said this, too. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. This in particular is talking about predatory pastors. Uh, he's talking about those who have leadership in the church and how they cloak what they're really there for and what they're really about and make themselves look just like one of the other sheep. Well, again, this ex echoes exactly what abuse experts teach today. Dr. Amos Alter again says, most offenders will deliberately establish themselves as the kind of person who wouldn't do that kind of thing. So, we have to wrap our heads around this, these realities. 
Abusers deceive not only the victims, but the entire community. Abusers are skilled at manipulating others, and abusers work to silence victims. Now let's talk about some broad categories of abuse, and then some more particular forms of abuse. Of course, uh, we can talk about broader categories, like child abuse, and then within that, we'll talk about some more particular types of abuse within child abuse. But So we have child abuse, we can talk about domestic violence, spouse abuse, or a more current term is something like intimate partner violence, is a term you'll hear. And then we can talk about clergy abuse, or pastor abuse, which comes in different forms. And there's other categories, too. Uh, elder, elder abuse, whether it's in a nursing home, or some sort of uh, facility, or just at home within the family. Uh, there's different forms of abuse. So what's the reality? Um, and again, this is part of humility, it's just learning. What are we up against? What, what, is, the, what, a, what is the research saying about the prevalence? Um, I'm going to pull statistics for child abuse from what's called the ACE study. Has anyone ever heard of ACEs before? Adverse Childhood Experiences? Yeah, a few of you. Good. This is a, a landmark study done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, and you can go online and learn a lot more about it. It's a really important study. But in that study, uh, for children, uh, for abuse in different forms, let's just start with the sexual abuse of children. In the U.S., one in four women and one in six men will be sexually abused before they turn 18. This is a conservative number, so that means about 20% of uh, folks in the U.S. will be victimized sexually as children before they turn 18. Um, now, of course, sexual abuse of a child would be something like a very simple definition would be something like sexual contact, any sexual contact between an adult and a child, or an older child, when there's a power difference. And of course, it would include things that are non-contact behaviors, like uh, exposure, voyeurism, sexting, child pornography, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, so that's just a very brief definition. Physical abuse of a child, it's about one in four children in the US, and this is any non-accidental injury to a child, so punching, beating, kicking, slapping, shaking, uh, that leads to injury. Those would be physical abuse. And by the way, the church, since we're church, um, that's not spanking. And we're not talking about spanking. Uh, we're talking about physically injuring a child. And so, you know, churches, um, that's a discussion. We have, to, we have to have that discussion with our people. Uh, if we have a culture where spanking is acceptable, where does that cross into, where's the line between spanking that would be appropriate and legal, and then when does that cross into physical abuse? Uh, of course, there are other forms of abuse, and here's um, from the ACE study. Um, these are 10 different adverse childhood experiences in the ACE study, and so you can see there's other forms of child abuse. Uh, emotional abuse is a common form of abuse, about 11% of kids in the U.S. And that would be, emotional abuse would be telling a child they're worthless. That's emotional abuse. Uh, so it's typically though, here in the ACE study, not, can you think of a time as a child where someone insulted you or humiliated you? It's asking in the ACE study, in your home was there a pattern, was there a pattern of humiliation? <coughs> a pattern of insult, a pattern of threats and shaming. That's what they're asking. 11% of children in the U.S. grow up with that in their home. And then other common forms for children, physical neglect would be withholding of things like food and warm clothing in the winter and medical care. Uh, and then emotional neglect is when a child is not told you're, you're loved, you're special. Uh, I'm always going to I'm always going to be here for you. When a child is not given that, that's emotional neglect. And then not here in the ACE study, but because we're in church, another common form of abuse is spiritual abuse. And that would be abuse under the cover of religion, right? So it would be using religion to control and shame and groom in some way. And it's often present with other forms of abuse. So God told me, the abuser says to the 15-year-old in the youth group, 
God told me that we're already married in his eyes. Now that's sexual abuse, but it's also spiritual abuse. You see, there's a spiritual component. God says, you must always obey me, says the, says the dad to the child that they're physically abusing and sexually abusing. That's, there's a spiritual element to that abuse, right? So that's spiritual abuse. If you tell, God is going to punish you. If you tell, you are going to hell. Spiritual abuse, right? If you send me your January paycheck, God will use that as seed money and multiply blessings. Then that kind of financial exploitation, that's, that's spiritual abuse, right? And Jesus called this out uh, when he said, there are those leaders who pray those really long, beautiful prayers as religious leaders. But in Mark 12, he said, they then use their position to take widows' houses away. They financially prey upon widows using their spiritual position. That's financial abuse, and that's, of course, spiritual abuse. Um, now, what's also remarkable in this study is that most of the people in the U.S., most of us, have at least one ace. Uh, and then many of us have more than one uh, as well. Uh, there's another line of research I don't have time to say a ton about, but it's called polyvictimization. And it just basically says, uh, if a child is victimized in one way, they're at a very high likelihood of being abused in other ways. And so you can't simply, you can't simply isolate one form of abuse and kind of address it. Uh, you have to address any form of abuse if you're really going to make a difference in prevention. Now, sometimes when I train, people say, oh, but Mike, that's the world. Of course, the world is bad, and there's lots of abuse in the world, but we're the church. And our experience, <laughs> both uh, anecdotally, is that that's just not the case. Um, there's really not a lot of difference. And there are even studies that show there are certain dynamics in religious communities that can lead to, uh, again, more victims, younger victims, and that's not only true with sexual offenders, um, that's true with like domestic violence. Religious women in domestic violence are much less likely to have connection to resources that can help them get out. And there's all sorts of religious reasons that lead them to simply trying to stay put and endure the abuse. Uh, so again, um, so just a few other statistics for other forms of abuse, domestic violence, um, about two to four million women per year are assaulted by a spouse or partner in the U.S. And the American Medical Association thinks it's about one in three in the U.S. will be a victim in their lifetime. And what that means is five million children in the U.S. a year are witnessing violence uh, against mom or, you know, in their home. Um, for domestic violence, the DuluthModel.org, the Duluth model is just a wonderful tool and resource to understand some different variations of what domestic violence looks like. So again, you can't simply isolate one form of abuse and address it because if you do a really good job with child protection and fighting child abuse, but you don't address domestic violence, what you have is, is children exposed to domestic violence, even if the violence is not directed at them, guess what? There's really no difference. If they're around it, the same negative impacts uh, that children receive from that, aggression, substance abuse, depression, and all sorts of other indicators of childhood distress, we found through research they're still there, even if it's not directed at them, <coughs> if they're around it. So you can't simply isolate one form of abuse. So real quickly, um, sexual assault, um, RAIN.org is a really good, R-A-I-N-N, -N is a really good organization. Uh, to learn more about sexual violence. Um, rape is the most underreported crime in the nation, serious crime in the nation, and so much of it is never reported, and then a much less, uh, lower percentage is successfully prosecuted. And then clergy abuse, there are lots of studies out there that give a wide range of statistics, but I think looking at all of them, it's very responsible to say that somewhere in the, in the range of 10 to 20% of pastors, not, you know, not to the extent of, um, of necessarily the worst type of sexual assault, but some sort of sexual crossing of boundaries, um, about 10 to 20% of clergy. 
And then the other major forms of clergy abuse, other than sexual abuse, would be financial abuse and just uh, the other major form would be just kind of an authoritarianism, uh, a domineering approach to leadership. Now, in some states like Oklahoma and in Virginia where I live, uh, abuse by clergy uh, is not always a crime. So if there is a quote-unquote consensual relationship between a pastor and a congregant, uh, that is not a crime in Oklahoma. That is not a crime in Virginia. Of course, a sexual assault would be uh, with, with there's, when there's coercion or force. But the kind of pastoral coercion, spiritual coercion, emotional coercion, and manipulation that comes with pastor abuse, that's not a crime in many states. And only about a dozen states is it a crime. In Texas, it's a crime. Uh, even if it's consensual, it's a crime if it's a pastor and a congregant. And that is absolutely right because it is an abuse of power. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Now, so one last major point on humility. What we need to do is reframe, given these dynamics, and given this prevalence, and given that there's a fire, a serious problem we need to address. We need to reframe prevention and how preventing abuse actually works. We cannot, first of all, outsource protecting the vulnerable. You can't do it. It has to be something the community itself takes ownership of. So we're an organization, and our job is to help equip organizations, but we can't do the prevention work. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna be here. Uh, when we train at churches, we're, we have to get on a, uh, get in our car and go home. We have to get on a plane and go home. It has to be something that ownership at the local level that has to that has to be the key. You can't simply say, "Here's your policy. Do your background checks." That's not going to work. It has to be a deeper level of ownership. And there is a difference between child protection and risk management. By the way, so much of the efforts that we have done in churches are actually what amounts to risk management for the institution because they've been driven by insurance companies and lawyers. Now, I have insurance, I'm thankful for it, I'm glad we have those things in our world, but that cannot be the main thing we're doing when we talk about the vulnerable, when we talk about prevention. Because if you're gonna focus on risk management, where are you gonna focus? You're gonna focus only on sexual abuse of children because that's where the liability is. That's not enough, as we've seen. If you're gonna focus on what type of uh, policy measures. They're gonna focus where? Within the, the structured ministry of the church, right? And where does most abuse occur, actually? Well, it occurs, when it does occur in churches, it's often in the unstructured times, but then we know from research, most abuse occurs in homes. So if we're only focused on the Sunday school hour, and don't get me wrong, I'm all for policy and strong protections during our Sunday school hour and children's worship and youth group and all that, wonderful. But that's just not enough. There's a huge gap in our prevention if we're not uh, you know, taking that into account. So I also run up against this mentality from church leaders or ministry leaders. Well, we really are excited to have you in here, Grace, and train us because we know that that one instance of abuse could just ruin our ministry. And I just say, please stop. Let's just talk about this for a second. This is, you know, look, where is your focus right now? For <coughs> Where's your focus? It's on the institution and the ministry. That's the wrong focus. Where was Jesus' focus? It was on the vulnerable. And so we need to take our focus off ourselves, how we're, and again, it's part of our narcissistic, often church culture. We're focused on how we're perceived. We're focused on what will happen to us and our image. And that just sets us up to respond completely in, in ways that are completely inadequate when abuse is exposed. So, as we said, when churches are doing well, we're training our staff and volunteers, and we have a strong policy for our structured ministry. So we need to reframe that and shift our mentality. We need to push our prevention measures into the hallways and the parking lot, and we need to have boundaries community standards for how we interact with kids, and rules about touch and isolation and other things that are understanding how grooming works, and that we're applying them 
in the hallways and in the unstructured times, and we're giving prevention tools into the hands of parents so they can take them when they decide whether to put their kid in a camp or which pediatrician should I go to, or do I have them in this ballet class? And we need to give those tools to parents and help them uh, take those prevention tools outside of the four walls of the church. So we need to consult with prevention experts who are first and foremost counseling us to put the protection of vulnerable people first, above any other concern, above uh, the, the, the risk to the institution. So we're broadening our policies, and we're broadening our education, and again, we're engaging the entire community. And so do you see, if we're going to do that, this is a moment for profound humility. For leaders to say, oh, we have a lot of work to do. Oh, God's calling us to do a lot. And it's going to take time. And it's not going to happen overnight. But we literally have a generation of work ahead of us. And this must be done, though. And again, it can't, we can't take, you can't take it on here as an individual. It has to be a community effort. And the leaders, most of all, have to take that on board. And so let's end that, that sober moment, uh, this heavy moment. Let's end it with this quote. Jesus is committed to ending abuse. In John, he starts his gospel this way. And in his gospel, we get this language of Jesus is the light of the world. His light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. So we have a Savior and a King, Jesus, who is determined to make everything new and wipe away every tear. And so let's end with this hope, knowing that Jesus is committed to us even more so than we are. And with his help, and with his spirit at work in our churches, we can make progress. So let's take a 10-minute break, and then guess what? I'm going to promise you. We're going to come back and we're going to actually start with hope in this next segment when we talk about empathy. And we're going to start on a high note and we're going to talk about the empathy that God has himself. That he's a God who sees and cares and understands the suffering and the devastation of abuse. And we're going to draw strength from that. And so we're going to come back and, and so we'll start on that positive note when we come back. All right, 10 minutes. Walk around, do a little self care. So, we talked about humility, and so the next consideration that I think is really going to push culture change that we have to wrestle with is, is empathy. And when I say empathy, first of all, what am I even talking about? Um, you know, empathy, you can talk about it in different ways. For me, the heart of empathy is the ability to put yourself in the place of someone and consider what they're experiencing, what they need, uh, what they're going through, and to, to understand and look upon them and care. So putting yourself in someone's place, how, does that sound like Jesus to you? Um, that sounds a lot like Jesus to me. And saying, what is, what is going on? And what do they mean? Of course, in Philippians 2, Paul says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So let's talk about empathy. And I want to start with that hope that we have a God who is full of empathy. He is always giving thought to us, caring for us. And so Jesus said this in John 8. He spoke and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, when I was growing up in church, we said Jesus is the light of the world. <coughs> he is a light for all the nations. What is that light that we're talking about? Well, in my church growing up, and maybe in yours, we always connected that light to the light of the good news, the gospel, of a message of personal salvation. 
a message of forgiveness of our personal sins. And to that, as a pastor, former pastor, I would say, amen. Amen. That's beautiful. And yet, this language, which occurs in, you know, John usually says something like, he's the light, for, he's a, a light of the world. The other Gospels use the language, he's a light for the nations. Same idea, though. Where does that language come from? And what is the original context? It comes from the prophets. Specifically, it comes from the prophet Isaiah. And so when you look at the original context, what is the light that Jesus brings in that context? In Isaiah, you have this concern for those who are vulnerable. God's people have been commanded to watch out for the widow and the orphan and to care for them. And those who are vulnerable, like the poor, to especially take up their cause and plead for them. Because God is a God who loves justice. That's part of his fundamental character. And so this language of light is in that broader context of Isaiah. And here we have, this is where it's from. It's from Isaiah 42. It's called by scholars the, a, one of the servant songs of Isaiah. And it's talking about the coming king, the Messiah, the servant of the Lord, who will come and bring a kingdom. And this is what it says. I am the Lord, I've called you in righteousness, I will take you by the hand and keep you, I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. Okay, now here's the issue, here's the question I want to talk about. In this context, you know, what is this light? What is this light? Well, when you interpret the Bible, what is the most important principle of Bible interpretation? When I was in seminary, this was hammered into my head over and over again. The context, the context of the whole Bible, the context in the, in the passage around it, the context. Context is king, one of my professors would say. Well, let's just read the context leading up to those verses in 6 and 7. Verse 1 of the same chapter, here's the lead up to that context. Behold my servant. So again, this is talking about Jesus, the Messiah who will come. I, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth what? Justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. And a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his law. Now, listen very carefully. <laughs> Is Jesus our personal Savior who brings us personal forgiveness of sins? Is that, is that Jesus? Is that our Jesus? Amen. Yes, it is. Is he also the ruler, the king of a kingdom that brings injustice, that brings mercy, and yes, justice? He is. It's a both end. <laughs> and why do we so often pit those things against each other in the church when the Bible doesn't do that? In this kingdom, there is, there is a king who brings a kingdom where we are forgiven, we are transformed to be people who care about justice, about protecting the poor and the vulnerable and the weak and the sick and so forth. And if you know, some of you know the answer to this, of why we put those against each other, it's actually a historical reason. And that's because historically, uh, in the U.S., across most of our denominations, conservative denominations historically align themselves with defending slavery, oppression, and again, that is in our history. And like it or not, that's our heritage for many of us in more conservative traditions. And so that's my tradition uh, in a more <coughs> conservative Presbyterian tradition. Uh, that's the, you know, for many denominations, this is our history. And so why do we have that fault line running through where we're pitting those two things against each other? And we're in fact using this, well, the real good news is only this good news pertaining to the personal forgiveness of our sins. 
It's not good news. Is it good news that vulnerable people are protected? That in the kingdom, that people who are likely to be exploited in this world and have people take advantage of them, that we put in things that stop that? Is that good news for people who are vulnerable? It is good news. And so Jesus' kingdom is that big. It's that powerful. And this is God's heart. This is a major theme throughout the whole Bible, is that God aligns himself with those who are vulnerable and calls his people to protect those who are vulnerable. So you read broad scriptures like Psalm 9. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. He's a stronghold, a refuge. What is that, what is that language, that metaphor? What does that connote? It, it's, he, if he's a refuge, if he's a stronghold, that means he's a place of, of safety. He's a place of protection. He's a place where someone who's been abused can come and sit in safety and have time where they're not in fear to recover. They don't have to worry about being wounded again, even though they're more vulnerable now after they've been wounded. Uh, all of that's implied in that language. And it goes on in Psalm 9 to say, He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. In other words, He's not a God who ever looks the other way when there's wrongdoing, when there's abuse, when there's oppression. He is a God who comes and helps. And He calls us, of course, to do the same. So the Bible speaks over and over again about God's heart for the vulnerable and the oppressed. And it goes back to the very beginning of the Bible. The very first pages of the Bible were written to, in most traditions, uh, in the conservative church especially, we believe this, that the initial books of the Bible were written to the Exodus generation, right? That's the context. And so in that generation, you had God's people come out of Egypt, out of oppression and abuse, and receive the Ten Commandments, and then right after that, in Exodus 22, you have this command, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you are sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them, and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows, and your children fatherless. Now, this is a very powerful verse, so let's, I want to make two main points out of it. One, why does God single out the sojourner and the widow and the orphan? Doesn't God care about justice for everybody? Of course he does. Absolutely. But why does he single out the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner? They're most vulnerable. They are, it's common sense, right? They are the most vulnerable. They are the easiest to exploit. And by the way, what are the other major categories of vulnerable people in the Bible? The what? Widow, the orphan, the poor, and the refugee. The poor, the widow, the orphan, the refugee, the sick. Uh, there's, there's others, but those are, yes, those are the main categories, right? <coughs> and if you do the word search, when I was a kid, uh, it was those big concordances, but now it's easy. <laughs> it's easy online. Why did every Christian family I knew have like four of those in the house? Um, booster seats, I guess, right? <laughs> what do we use now? I don't know. <laughs> okay, but now you just do the search for those terms. Guess what? It's literally hundreds of times in the Bible, God is speaking up for these vulnerable categories. What is on God's heart? That's how you know it's on his heart. It's close to his heart. And by the way, it's not just in one part of the Bible. It's in the laws. It's in the prophets. It's in the Psalms and the wisdom literature. It's in the history books. It's in the gospels. Did Jesus ever hang out with someone who was sick or someone who was poor? or an immigrant, or a child, or a widow? Did he, do you remember any stories about that? What kind of things are stories? Pretty much, that's what he's doing. Why? Because he's a king who brings a kingdom, where in that kingdom, what's the focus? Good news. Yes, of personal forgiveness, but also good news of justice for those who are vulnerable and oppressed. And so, absolutely, this is, that's why God is singling out vulnerable people, because God knows, and, and so if you notice the second major point is, notice the language. If you know your Bible, you know the Exodus story, where does this language all come from? 
It comes from the beginning of the book of Exodus. It comes from the story we just read. Who were sojourners in Egypt at the beginning of this, of this book? God's own people were. Who were being oppressed? God's own people were. Again, it's the same language. Who cried out? And by the way, that word cry in the original, it means it's, it's always in a context of slavery or oppression and rape. It's a technical word. They're crying out, God's people at the beginning of the Exodus story, and who heard their cry? Who had empathy for them? God did. And that's the turning point of the whole story. God saw, he knew, he cared, and he worked to bring salvation, deliverance, redemption, and to bring them out of that. Because God's will, God's heart, is that no one should have to live under abuse and oppression. He wants us to be set free from those. And so, and by the way, the end of the verse comes from the story too. When God visited judgment upon Egypt, and there was the death of the firstborn, well, now there were new widows in Egypt, and now there were new orphans because of that judgment. What is the whole point of this then? God is saying, remember what I've done for you, because the way the world works is that those who have power do what? They do what they want. They take what they want, and they say, just try and stop me. And God is saying very powerfully to his people, not so with you. But he turns power on its head. He says, power exists because now God's people, guess what? They're going to have their own nation. They're going to have all sorts of power. And the question is, how are they going to use it? Are they going to use it like every other nation? Or are they going to be God's holy, chosen people, <coughs> distinct, and that they use power how? Not to exploit, not to take, not to objectify and dehumanize, but how? To bless, to protect to serve, to ensure that those who are vulnerable are protected, to advocate for them. This is the only legitimate use of power in this world. Because in this world, all power and authority in heaven and on earth belongs to who? When Jesus rose from the dead, he said, all power in heaven and on earth belongs to me. So I have power, and I do, in my own home, with my kids. I have power in my marriage. And my wife has power over me because of our, because we're connected, right? And I had power over people in my church when I was a local pastor. And I have power over others. And you have power in your, in your workplace, in your homes, in your roles as leaders, in the church. The only legitimate use of that power is to use it in ways that Jesus would use it. To serve, to bless, to protect. And from the very beginning of the Exodus generation, out of slavery, out of that dehumanization and exploitation and abuse, God says, lift up your head. From page one of the Bible, lift up your head. You are made in my image. You have inherent value and worth and dignity. And so constantly the Bible is affirming our worth and our dignity. And Jesus says, whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. That's a powerful statement about the value and dignity of children in a world at the time when children were property, for the most part, in many parts of the world. And of course, there are still parts of the world where that's true. So, we of course know Jesus' words, condemning anyone who would, would violate a child. So this is who our God is. He's a God who empathizes with the vulnerable, who understands what it's like to be vulnerable, and he calls us to be people who understand and have empathy also. I was at a church training, and in one of the breaks, an older woman, probably in her 80s, came to the front and she said, thank you, this is really helpful to me. I just want you to know that I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. When I was a little girl, I was violated. And I've been in church all of my life, and I have never heard anyone speak this way about abuse, about God's heart for the vulnerable, I've never heard anyone talk this way. And when you started talking about these verses and about God and his heart for the vulnerable and the abused, my heart soared. 
I want that for every survivor of abuse. Every survivor of abuse must hear that message in our churches. They need that message, and they need to hear it. So leaders must use your particular faith. You know, whatever tradition you're in, you have to leverage that tradition and the ways that you speak to powerfully uphold the dignity and value of children, of others who are vulnerable, and condemn any form of abuse. And so survivors, especially, need to hear that. So, so leaders, pastors, and other leaders, you need to account for the survivors in the room. When you're, when you're crafting a message, it's just a good practice, and however you prepare, uh, you know, most of us have a process when we prepare to teach, make sure part of your process is to say, how is this going to hit, how could this hit survivors who are in the room? And is that, you know, how can I make sure that I'm thinking through uh, what that's going to be, and how can I make sure that I'm affirming their dignity, I'm condemning abuse, and of course never putting any blame on them, and making a clear distinction that it is not their fault. Uh, so those are just things that need to happen. And then for leaders further, protecting the vulnerable is not like an option for a leader. That's basically what a leader biblically is called to be, uh, in my view. And I think you can go to many, many passages where this is just clear. When you look at that language in the Bible of what it means to be a shepherd, all the original con like that language is used in the New Testament, Peter and others use it, right? to say that elders and pastors are shepherds of the people. They're the ones who are, are in charge. And, and, and the whole point of that metaphor, again, if you look in the prophets where it comes from in Ezekiel 34, read that passage. What's it about? It's about the abuse of power and how the leaders are using their position to indulge themselves. They're self-absorbed. They're ignoring and neglecting the sheep, and the sheep are becoming a prey for wild animals. And in fact, some of the shepherds themselves are preying upon the sheep and consuming them. And God says that he will come himself and shepherd his people and seek the lost and bind up the wounded and feed them in justice. Does any of that language sound familiar? Seeking and saving the lost? Where does that come from? Again, it's all in the Gospels. When I was a kid growing up in the church, I'm old enough that we had a thing in church called a flannel graph. Yeah, anybody have a flannel graph? So my curriculum when I was a little boy uh, in, in Covenant Christian Fellowship in Richmond, Virginia, and I had the flannel graph, there were sheep and shepherds all over that flannel graph because we had a curriculum that was based on the Gospels. Jesus is always talking about seeking the lost and sheep and shepherds. And again, the whole prophetic background of that is what is true leadership? And what is the what is what are we about in church? is a place of refuge for those who are vulnerable. Good news, yes, forgiveness of sins, amen. And also, protection for the vulnerable, safety. All right, as much as I've put a lot of verses before you in that last segment, we have to take the, the other side, the negative side, of how the Bible can be used. So, simple question. In church, what's the most effective tool to manipulate people? Yeah. The Bible. <laughs> okay? It's just so important that we acknowledge that. And as much as, you know, that horrifies us to, to acknowledge that, it is so important. Uh, we see this all the time from abusers. When abu an abuser is caught, when someone's trying to hold them accountable, one of the things that comes up very often is a statement like this. Tell me what you think of this statement. Well, we're all sinners. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Okay. My, my favorite question of all time is, in what sense? That's my favorite question. Because <laughs> I think it's just so important to ask that question all the time. In what sense are we talking about? Is it true in one sense we're all sinners? Amen. That, that's important to preach. However, how do abusers use that? Experts call it sin leveling. <laughs> We're trying to level out any sin. And what is the effect of that? When someone's being called out for abuse, it's, it's basically putting their abuse on the level of what? Any other sin that's, that's less serious. It's a way, it's a clever way to use the Bible, to use theology, 
in the church to minimize what you're doing and avoid accountability. That's a tactic. We see it all the time. Using grace and forgiveness and pitting that against accountability, that's another tactic, right? Oh, well, if we're going to put this in place, I just don't think that's right because in the church we believe in forgiveness. And if we're forgiving, we don't need to have any accountability. Is that what the Bible teaches? Is the Bible against? Is it? It's definitely pro-forgiveness, okay? But is it anti-accountability? Of course not. And sometimes the most loving thing you can do for someone who is abusive, in fact, that is the most loving thing you can do, is insist that they be accountable. And that's a very biblical thing. And of course, there's other scriptures that get easily twisted. Um, we'll talk about Matthew 18 and the call to, in certain contexts, go to our brother or sister who sinned and not take it any further publicly or something like that. We'll come back to that one. But many other ways. But that, the point is, the Bible is so often used to do harm. And so here's the thing. As a, as a former pastor, I have no problem saying that pastors, there are amazing pastors out there who do wonderful things. But pastors, because we have so much power and trust, can use their position to do terrible, terrible things. And we need to be accountable. And those who have a lot of power need to be accountable. I don't, that's an offending one bit as a former pastor. And if, even if I was currently a pastor, that would not offend me one bit. It's so important. The same thing's true of the church. The same thing's true of the Bible. It can be doing wonderful, wonderful things. It can also be used to do terrible things. So we have to just be aware of that. Okay, empathy is also going to, when we understand God's heart and who he is, it's going to push us to respond with empathy to those who are uh, crying out for help, for those who are abused in our response. So we already saw that God is a God who never ignores the cry of the victim. And he doesn't turn away, and he understands, and he calls us to do the same. And in fact, Jesus told a story about responding to someone who's been assaulted. Do you remember that story? It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, this was a, an adult who was assaulted and robbed, but there's so much in the story that is important for us to consider in the church. The religious people, of course, pass by, you know the story, right? And do not help. And the Good Samaritan comes, the one you wouldn't expect, right? And helps, and he binds up his wounds. And where does that language come from? Ezekiel 34, so that's what true shepherds do. And then he takes him to a place where he can be treated and receive nourishment and ongoing medical treatment in an inn. And that's where you know, medical practices occurred at that time before hospitals, right? Which were started by who, mostly? A lot of early hospitals were started by Christians, right? Because they understood the empathetic heart of Jesus, right? So he said, whatever you, whatever you need to spend, take care of him. And I'll repay you when I come back. Now, most of us cannot say to someone, spend anything and we'll, we'll take care of it. And most of us cannot spend our entire day with someone who has been abused. But we have something to give. All of us do. And it's our time, and it's our attention, and it's sometimes our money. Uh, but responding in ways, not just individually, but as churches. We have time, and we have uh, resources to invest, and we all have limitations. But it's worth asking, what can we give? What can we do? How can we help? Right? So this is what we're called to do. Whatever we can. So, why don't victims come forward? This is a key question, and it gets to that issue of empathy. Because many, many church leaders, sadly, I've seen, they think, well, this victim is, is acting in this particular way. They didn't come forward right away. They're acting in this way. And if I were in their shoes, I would have done this or this or this. And because they're not acting the way I would have done it, I'm kind of skeptical of them. You see, that's a failure of empathy. And there's a range of normal behaviors. When you actually look at what is normal, there's a whole range of normal behaviors that victims demonstrate. So let's just start with this question. Why don't victims come forward? And I'm interested if you're willing to share. What are some of the reasons? There's all sorts of reasons. But what are some of the reasons that come first to your mind? Shame. Shame. Right. Even though 
It's not their fault. And by the way, most survivors know this, but they still struggle with shame and guilt. And part of their brain, they understand it very well. That was not my fault. And yet, they still struggle with that. And that's one of the cruelties of abuse. And of course, it keeps many of them from coming forward. Absolutely. That's normal. It alienates them. Fear. Absolutely. And there's a fear, and it's operating at multiple levels. Sometimes it's simply the fear of the abuser and what they would do. And of course, many abusers will directly threaten their victims. But there's also the fear of what if what? What if I'm not believed? So let, let's just put ourselves in, in a victim's shoes for a second. If they, in a position of vulnerability, already have been violated and wounded in an egregious way, what are we asking them to do? We're asking them to again put themselves in a place of vulnerability <coughs> in coming forward. Do you see that? Do you see how that is, that is not an easy place to be? And what if they're not believed? And what if they're not helped? Because so many victims have told us at Grace over the years, the, the abuse was awful, but what was worse was when I was not believed by my church. And that devastating spiritual betrayal, victims are making themselves vulnerable to that. And that's a hard, hard thing. Uh, so, of course, many victims have a hard time coming forward because that's just an overwhelming that's an overwhelming dynamic. And then, of course, younger children, some of them, they don't really fully understand what's happening. They're either confused or they don't understand that it's abuse. Or the only one, sadly, for many younger children, who is explaining what this is that they're experiencing is who? The abuser. He's the one shaping how they're viewing it and what, how they're experiencing it. And so there's, there's many, many other things we could highlight. But it is just, again, it is so vital that we understand it is not easy to come forward. And so when someone does overcome some of those things and come forward, what do we know now? What is so important for us to do immediately is to praise their courage and thank them and say, I'm so sorry, and affirm that it's not their fault, right? Believe that. So what I often run into in churches is this mentality. Oh well, wait, <laughs> the Bible says you hear both sides. There's a proverb that says you hear both sides. And in our country, in our justice system, what do we have in our in our courtrooms? What what's what's the what are the rules in the courtroom? Well, it's innocent until proven guilty, right? And it's in a criminal case, the bar of evidence is what? The bar of evidence in a criminal case is proof beyond what? A reasonable doubt, okay? In a civil case, it's usually a preponderance of evidence. Okay? Now, how do we navigate that? Because experts say it is vital for healing to begin when someone discloses abuse that they are believed. So how do we navigate both of those realities? Well, here's how I think about it. I think about it in terms of context. When someone discloses abuse to you, what are they saying, basically? Help me. They're crying out for help. And as a Christian, what are, how are we called to respond? We're to, we're to help. I, of course I'm going to help you. Of course I'm going to walk with you, whatever's next. I can do that 100% of the time and still believe in a criminal courtroom there are rights for, for those who are accused. Those are not in conflict because that's a different context. In the courtroom, of course, there's going to be a process. There's going to be rules. There's going to be due process and so forth. That doesn't keep me personally from responding to someone in a certain way. And nothing is harmed because we know, actually, by the way, through research, the amount of false allegations, statistically speaking, is very low. So I'm not saying you convict people before you, know, you can have any kind of, I'm just saying, and how do you respond to a victim? You can absolutely respond appropriately in a way that will be heal ho hopefully starting them on a healing process while still affirming rights for others. <coughs> so, victim blaming is another key area where we have to get some tools. 
So we have to know the common types of things that would, again, put blame on a victim. So victims say, well, when I came forward, people started asking me questions like, well, what were you doing there? What did you do right before this happened? Did you, did you start the conversation? Did you text them first? Uh, you know, as if that makes a difference, right? Um, and then, what happened? Did you, did you, did you scream? Did you run away? Did you try to go? They start asking all of these questions, right? And again, we have to understand a little bit about what's normal. And there's a range of behaviors. So people talk about our fight or flight response, but that's actually way too narrow. What's another major category? Freeze. Freeze. And in fact, that's the more normal situation. When someone you know and trust all of a sudden reveals themselves to be a wolf in sheep's clothing, it's more normal. It's the most normal situation is to freeze and not know what to do. And because you're trying to figure out what is happening, why is this? And so that is normal. Another common response is something called fawning. Fawning is simply, it's simply going along with whatever is happening because you're terrified. And so whether, whatever, whatever response is there, it's just never the fault of the victim. What they're wearing, why they were there, those are just all the wrong questions. That is not at all to be asked. It's simply, I'm so sorry. Now, if you're not even sure what happened, and you, you're asked, like say a child is saying, you know, I'm upset about this, this thing that happened, is it okay to say what happened? Of course it is. That's fine. But you ask open-ended questions, not direct questions, right? Okay. So those are just some things we have to be aware of. And then, again, the whole point of this is that there's a whole range of behavior that is normal. And we can't project what we would have done onto one person. Because here's the thing. When someone comes forward, where, why do many... Victims hesitate to come forward. They, the, another reason we didn't say is that where does the scrutiny go to, typically? Yeah. It goes to them, into their credibility, and they're put under the spotlight. And of course, that's, that's not okay. So we have to be careful in how we respond, <coughs> and we have to put ourselves in their shoes and be careful. Now, we want to respond um, with, with other other skills, and I don't have a ton of time to go into the ACE study that I mentioned earlier. But aside from the bigger takeaways in that study, other than that ACEs are incredibly common, um, it's shocking how common ACEs are in kids in the US. Uh, but what that study also shows is a strong correlation between these adverse childhood experiences and children in their development. Does it make sense to you that children, by their very nature, are developing, they're malleable, and when something so toxic and destructive like abuse is, is perpetrated against them, that it does damage. That often has consequences for the rest of their lives. So what we've seen in the ACE study is that there's an impact on child development, there's an impact on brains and bodies and immune systems that are developing, and then, of course, there's risky health behaviors like reaching to alcohol to numb the pain, or drugs, or early promiscuity, or other things. <coughs> uh, and, of course, those have health consequences as well. So all of that in the ACE study is showing that there's a lot of long-term consequences when you have these ACEs and childhood trauma. And not today because you're doing self-care, but there's... Um, the first Surgeon General of California is Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. And she has a, a wonderful 20 minute TED talk that you can watch on the ACE study that's amazing. She also has a book. And, she, and um, we really have to start to, as a whole country and as whole communities, wrestle with this. Because here's what the ACE study shows if you have even one ACE, in the group of one ACEs, you have higher rates of cancer, heart disease, obesity, anxiety, depression, and then it goes up and up and up the more ACEs. 
And then there are other studies, now that's correlation, which is not necessarily causation, but there are other studies that are then showing the mechanisms for the causation that is actually there often with this. So this is, uh, Nadine Burke Harris calls it, Dr. Harris um, calls it, this is the biggest public health crisis that we're all facing, is childhood trauma. Now, just a little bit about trauma. Trauma is not what was done to you. Trauma is what happens in our brains and bodies when something like abuse is perpetrated against us. It's what's happening in response to it. It's the damage and the impact it's having. So, victims are often experiencing a lack of safety in the present even though the terror happened in the past. So let me just give you an everyday example. Let's say you're walking down the street and out from an alley pops this ferocious dog. And you can tell by the dog's posture, uh, he's a threat. It's baring its teeth, it's growling, hair's up on the back of the dog's, the hair standing up on the back of the dog's, um, on his back. And what happens in your body, in your brain, when you <coughs> encounter something like that? What happens? Well, you, your body releases chemicals to help you respond, right? Uh, your, your heartbeat starts pumping and cortisol is released, and I'm not a doctor uh, or an expert in this, but you know, adrenaline, cortisol, other things are released into your body, right? And that's actually a really good thing that your body does because it prepares you to do what? Run away or make a quick decision to step into that door, off the street, or whatever it is. And that's how your body responds. But when your husband is abusing you, and those chemicals are released over and over and over again. Uh, you get PTSD. That's what it is. Uh, when you're a child and, and your dad comes home and there's emotional abuse and you're scared uh, because of what he says to you and lashes out at you or physically harms you, when that's released over and over again, uh, it does damage and it's actually maladaptive in your body. Right? So that's that's what's happening with trauma. And so the thing that ordinarily is a very good thing is then um, it's being triggered and it's happening and you can't really control it. So you get panic attacks, for example, or you have nightmares, or you, you have trouble regulating other things in your life. And so the terror of the past is breaking in to the present. Another story my colleague told me, I think it's a true story, but whether or not it's true, I think it works. Imagine this. Uh, uh, two, two old friends sitting in their, their living room having tea. And an ambulance goes down the street, a siren. And one of them jumps up and looks around in a panic and runs and hides in the closet. What's happening in that situation? Why did they panic? Well, it's because that older friend survived the Holocaust. And that siren from their childhood triggered, you know, this terror from the past to break in. And they, and even in their brain, in, in their cognitive brain, they knew, I'm in my living room, I'm having tea with my friend, that's an ambulance, I'm safe. There are no Nazis with me. What happened? Their body responded. So when you have this happening over and over, especially over and over and over again, uh, you, that's where you have PTSD, you have these trauma symptoms where your survival brain kicks in and takes over, and you have these, you have these symptoms of trauma. So, given that reality, <laughs> um, and this goes to when I was a pastor, when someone is struggling with these sorts of symptoms of trauma, the most important thing to help them is not for me as a pastor to sit down with them, and let's just talk it out. Because it's an issue in their brain. And so, you know, experts who study this now, it's, it's, it's again, it's some real impact in your actual brain that's been reset. So, when you have these common symptoms like nightmares, sleep trouble, fear, terror, like flashbacks, panic attacks, fear of a specific person, situation, you know, sharp changes in behavior, anxiety, depression, acting out sexually, behavior problems like defiance or hyperactivity. Um, 
self-harm. Uh, now, not all of these symptoms are related to abuse. No, of course not. But many of them are uh, in victims of abuse. You have symptoms like this. So notice that these things are very basic things about being human. Eating and sleeping. Um, using the restroom. Just being safe. Feeling safe. Being able to sit in a room and focus on something. Those things all become very hard when you have trauma. And so, uh, again, that's the deeper impacts of trauma. And so these basic things go wrong because these are not surface wounds. We're not talking about scratches on the surface. We're talking about deep, deep wounds to our personhood. So, as a pastor, let's say someone came into my office for pastoral counseling. And they said, Mike, I just wanted to talk to you today as my pastor. And I would say, great, let's have a seat, let's talk. And if they said to me, well, Mike, I'm having a problem with my spine. What is the responsible thing for me to do as a pastor? Is it to say, well, let's just get you up here on the desk and get in here and you know, just see what we can do? Of course not. That would be, that would be not only a bad idea, it would be morally wrong. Okay. So here's the thing. I'm not telling churches to back away from trauma victims. I'm simply saying it's a both and that we are called to walk alongside survivors and provide them support and you know, encouragement and care, but we are not to address these types of issues in counseling uh, because we're not equipped uh, with the training we need to, to do and lead them uh, into a place of healing. So we want to refer whenever possible to trauma-informed care in the wake of abuse. And here, here's the thing. Not everyone can afford a trauma therapist or counselor. Churches maybe can help with that. Uh, but many people who still can't afford it are just not in a place where they're ready to go and do that. That's fine. So uh, if you are going to try to find someone, uh, I would encourage you to find someone who does something called EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. Um, it's related to trauma and how our brain, what's happening in our brains. And if someone is trained in EMDR, whether or not you do that particular technique, they'll have an understanding. And if they're licensed in that, they should be able to help you. Now, if they're not helpful to you, find a new therapist, just like you would find a new doctor or a new whatever. But even if you're not in a place of being ready to go, here's a few techniques. Um, just, and you can do this with kids or yourself, just cross your arms if you want to, and just tap on opposite shoulders, back and forth. Now, if you're, if you're feeling yourself like a panic attack coming on, or really, really anxious, and you're driving, just tap, <laughs> just tap. You can do this sitting, tap, tap your, Tap on your on back and forth, back and forth. If you work with kids, you can have them do this and call it a butterfly hug. You know, do something, you know, kid friendly, right? But here's the thing, trauma's in the right side of our brain, I'm told. I don't know for sure. I'm a pastor by training. And we get stuck in that part of our brain. And so the back and forth, the left and right, and that's what EMDR does. It activates both sides and it gets you, hopefully it gets you unstuck. Right? So you can calm down. Right? And so that's one, one way. So tap your feet, tap on your tap on your knees, tap on your shoulders, tap on the steering wheel, back and forth, back and forth. That's one technique. And then another is um, is to take water and just take a sip of water and swish it around in your mouth and swallow. And we don't know for sure why this works, but it helps many traumas, uh, many trauma victims. In fact, I have a friend who is a court-appointed advocate and works with helps domestic violence victims and other victims of other forms of abuse. And she told me she had a particular awful case of domestic violence where this wife had to go and testify in court and it was terrifying for her. And so she taught her this technique and she didn't have water accessible. So she said, just use your saliva. So you can literally do this with any beverage or your own saliva and you just collect saliva in your mouth, and swish it around, and swallow. And then there are others. And you can look up other techniques 
But of course, breathing exercises are really good. Just breathing in deeply through your nose, <clears throat> really slow and hold it, and then breathe out. Um, those are some techniques. All right. As far as personally responding, though, as we kind of end this next um, segment, this second segment on empathy, again, just in summary, of course, we are called to when, let's say it's a friend who discloses they were abused as a child, uh, or someone who's currently in a violent marriage or partner, partnership, never blaming them, never minimizing it, never rushing the recovery. And this is a very <coughs> biblical idea, to simply weep with those who weep, and lamenting with them. In fact, that's why in the Psalms, uh, the theologians carve up the Psalms into categories, and what's the biggest category? By far the biggest category are these Psalms of lament. And those laments are simply crying out to God, not always in a situation of abuse, but some hard situation, and if you look in the passages and the verses, sometimes the context is oppression and abuse. And so there's a crying out to God with feelings of betrayal, confusion, anger, and does God say, how dare you say that to me? How dare you feel that way? Of course not. That's the whole reason they're in the Bible. Because God, God says, of course you feel this way. Of course you feel confused. Of course you feel angry. Of course you feel betrayed. Of course you feel like no one is there to help you. And you feel like you're in a pit in despair. And so the biggest thing you can do practically is just sit with someone in that situation. And not try to give them a spiritual take on the matter. A spiritual platitude. Those are often the worst things we can do. Now, if they're asking theological questions, that's different. But the most important thing is to sit there in the pain and validate it. Just validate it with your presence. Validate their dignity by your presence. And say, I'm so sorry. Of course you feel that way. Of course you feel like everyone's left you in the trade. Of course. Of course. And just say, I'm so sorry. We don't want to push forgiveness. And we don't want to forbid anger. Sometimes anger is seen as the enemy. If you don't process through that anger, it's going to, if you hold it in and suppress it, it's going to do damage in your actual body. It will. It will. So you have to express it. You have to process through it and work through it. All right. I'm going to take, we're going to have questions at the end, by the way. Um, but if you want to ask questions in the break, I'm available as well. So let's take 10 more minutes, and then we'll come back. And in our last segment, we'll talk about <coughs> courage. All right, so our last segment, before we do Q&A, we're going to talk about courage a little bit. So courage, of course, first of all, comes as no surprise at this stage of the morning to say we have to be courageous to speak uncomfortable truth. And sometimes that's very practical to say, I'm sorry. That's not a relationship between the youth pastor and the teenager. That's not a relationship. That's abuse. Uh, or a pastor with an adult congregant. That's not an affair. That's clergy abuse. Um, our language matters. Uh, the truth matters. And we have to say things, and especially leaders, I mean, we have to call attention to uncomfortable truths. The Bible condemns incest, for example. I know survivors who have said, I wish my pastor would have said this from the pulpit. I might not have been able that day to get out from under that, but it would have meant the world to me to have my pastor condemn that. So we have to have courage to speak the truth, we have to have the courage to confront denial and myths. You know, what's denial? Well, it's abuse happens over there. Those denominations, those families, those neighborhoods. But it's also more personal. It's, well, I know him. He would never do that. She would never do that. But that's exactly what Jesus told us when he said, they are like a wolf 
in sheep's clothing. The whole point of that is it's someone you wouldn't expect. And if you listen to any abuse expert today, they'll tell you the same thing. Uh, abusers cultivate that, that very persona for a reason. So we have to get specific. We have to confront denials. And of course, and none of us can do this alone. We have to speak uh, and push back against these. You know, abuse doesn't happen here. Look around, everyone's so nice in my church. Nothing could ever happen here. Well, that's, that mentality is what enables abuse. Abusers are usually strangers. That's not true. <laughs> They're almost always someone who's known. Uh, only men abuse. That's not true. Most offenders are male, yes. Uh, but there are also women who abuse. False reports of abuse are common, but <coughs> it's a myth. Uh, there's a very small percentage of allegations are false. Um, sexual abuse victims victimize others. That's a, a kind of a cultural myth that a lot of us have grown up with. Uh, if someone was victimized as a child, they're more likely to offend against others as an adult, and that's just not true. That's another stigma that a lot of sexual abuse survivors uh, have, another weight that they carry. Uh, victims just want attention or money, right? Uh, and with other forms of abuse more specifically, like domestic violence, well, we would have known. That couple, that family that's so nice on Sunday morning, we would have known if something was happening behind closed doors at home. And that's just not true. Well, he's violent in his marriage because he was abused as a child. Now, some abusers are people who have been victimized as children. But is abuse we've suffered ever an excuse for abusing other people? No. Abusers, some abusers bring up their childhood abuse as an excuse to continue abusing or to minimize what they've done, or explain it. If you bring it up, though, as a reason for an abuser to change, many of them are not interested in that. And that's the difference. It's fine to bring it up if it's going to push us to change, because it's so destructive. And in fact, many there are studies that show a lot of male sex offenders of children, they bring it up as an excuse, uh, and then they're actually, some of them are lying on that, uh, essentially. Studies have shown. Um, not, again, not all, but, you know, many, many are. Um, well, he only hit her once. Well, sometimes that's all it takes to terrify someone and gain them control over them. Sometimes you don't even have to touch them physically. And you use verbal abuse, emotional abuse to control. Uh, it doesn't matter. And by the way, the research across any form of abuse Emotional abuse is not less destructive <coughs> than physical abuse or sexual. It's as, if not more, destructive. So it's never, well, it was only verbal abuse. He never touched her. That's not, that's not the mentality we need. We need to take it all very seriously. Uh, she must have set him off. It's none of our business. What goes on in their home? Why doesn't she just leave? Again, uh, we need to push back against all of those. And we don't have time to go into the reasons women don't leave an abusive partner or, or husband, uh, but there's really good reasons why they don't. Uh, we need to understand those and help in ways that are helpful. Uh, Courts of abuse myths, again, it's an affair. Um, the, the coercion is always physical. It's often spiritual manipulation uh, and emotional manipulation. She, want, she wanted to stop uh, she, if she could. If she was innocent, she would have spoken up earlier. Again, we have to push back against all of this. And then beyond that, there's cultural issues that we need to confront. Uh, there are cultural dynamics that make faith communities more vulnerable. Uh, we've already highlighted some cultural issues, uh, like victim blaming. But there are others. In the church, we have often a high respect, and we teach a high respect for authority, but that can easily be misused, right? Uh, if children hear all day long, obey your teachers, obey your parents, obey your church leaders, obey, what is, what is the message they get essentially? Obey the adult. Are you allowed to say no? No, you're not. <coughs> now, even if none of us would say it that way, that's kind of in the cultural air. And so we have to teach children, and we have to teach them when it's okay to say no. We have to teach them about consent. 
and that, hey, even if, you know, Aunt Susan wants to give you a hug, if you don't want to give her a hug, that's okay. And for many of us, this needs to change in our parenting, and it's changed how I've parented with my own kids. And so to teach them that, hey, any touch should be with consent. Uh, we can do that and enforce a healthy view of that with kids. Of course, any patriarchal views that men are inherently superior, uh, that is an easy setup for abuse. Uh, we have to push back against those. Now, even in our churches where we're not teaching that, of course, maybe, but if we have any kind of teaching where the men have a certain authority, even if we qualify that in some way, men are going to use that as an excuse to abuse. So we have to account for that. So it has to be accounted for. Uh, many women who grew up, like I did, in the 80s and 90s, are pushing and writing about their experience in growing up in something we call often purity culture broadly. And this is, again, a setup for abuse, where many young women are taught um, if a man is lusting, that is how it's your fault because of how you dress. And women view their own bodies as the problem, as evil. And so that is a perfect setup for abuse because if anything happened, it was your fault. And abusers love that teaching. Now, again, I'm not against teaching children about what is appropriate in the arena of sexuality, but we have to do much, much better. And so uh, that is just, that's a whole kind of, um, that's a whole range of teachings that we don't really have time to go into in more detail, but it's incredibly important. Uh, in the church, as I mentioned already, we're sensitive to gossip. We need permission, though, from the pastors to say, hey, when you say something, when that volunteer or adult in the hallway is crossing a boundary with a child, it's not gossip to intervene and say something and hold them accountable. Uh, we've already said something about grace and forgiveness and how that can be misused. We just have a, a need for more education, and that's just... Culturally, it's not often normal to have education on abuse in church. And then distinguishing sinning and abuse. As simple as that sounds, it is one of the most important things for churches to do. Continually make that distinction. There is a difference between you sinning and being the victim of abuse. Sinning and being sinned against. Sinning and being violated. Children can often not make that distinction on their own. And then as they grow up, they, they have a hard time continuing to make that distinction. So we have to make that for them and continue to make that distinction. It is not your fault. It was done to you. You were sinned against. Abusers love to make it into a mutual, so, quote unquote, situation. And then, of course, polarization is killing us. The polarization in our churches, the polarization in our country, politically and otherwise. And so what do children hear growing up around their table? Oh, well, that politician on that side of the aisle, those people are the bad <coughs> people. And of course, they would be abusive, right, when the allegation comes out in the news. They hear this around the table. And if it's the other side of the aisle, those people, that's the right party, the right people, the right beliefs, the people who are going to do, you know, fix the world. I don't believe them. Women want attention. They want money, which is, again, not true, ridiculous. What do you sign up for when you come forward with abuse allegations? A whole lot of hurt. Even if you're believed, it's still a whole lot of hurt. Often. So, what are we teaching kids when, we, when they hear those conversations? We're only against abuse where? Over there. But not in our community, not our people. So you won't be believed. That's what we're teaching them. Now that's probably not our intention. But that's what we're teaching them. Polarization is killing us. And what are we teaching to future perpetrators? If you abuse here, will you be held accountable? Nope, you will not. So it's killing us. We have to address that. <coughs> we have to have the courage to educate all and engage all in prevention. So you've already heard me say this, so very quickly. <laughs> we have to educate at every level, adults, kids, and leaders, especially need training to think about these cultural issues in the church. I have some books up here. There's more books out there for kids that are really, really good. Um, again, don't read them today. Don't read them to your, you know. Don't, don't read the books today. Take a break. Um, all forms of abuse. 
child abuse, domestic violence, clergy abuse, etc. And leaders must anticipate and overcome the barriers to educating the congregation. Most of the people in churches are going to think, I don't know anyone who's abused, or I don't work with the youth group, I don't work in the nursery, why do I need to go? Uh, all of those things uh, are real barriers, and it's the leader's job to overcome those. So we need to empower every adult to speak up when there is abuse or when there's a concern. And of course, we need to educate on a basic offender tactics in the church. And right now, there's not a lot of education on this. So we have a lot of work to do. All right, so every adult should know what to do when three things are happening. If there's, an, if there's abuse that has happened or alleged, if there's a policy violation, or there's any other concern. You can't put every concern in a policy. If you put every concern in a policy, first of all, you can't, and it would be a terrible policy, it would be too long. <laughs> so, you have three categories, and you say, look, here are the people in our church you can go talk to if you're concerned about someone who's vulnerable and what's going on, or if there's a policy violation, and then they should know how to report abuse uh, in certain circumstances, which we'll talk about in a moment. All right. Now, for, for clergy abuse and kind of how adults relate, um, how do we prevent that? Is it just never be alone with a woman? Is that the solution? Uh, what used to be called the Billy Graham rule, because you would never you know, be in a, eat dinner, be in a car, or have a conversation with just a woman in the room. Um, <coughs> well, is that the solution? Uh, I don't think it's the solution, although in certain circumstances that might be fine or appropriate. So let me just tell you a story. Does anyone know the name John Lasseter? Yeah, a few of you. So he was the head of uh, Pixar, right? All those amazing Pixar movies, and now at Disney, right? So he was so inappropriate with the females in the organization that the response, uh, and you can read the news stories about this, they decided, well, because he can't simply control himself and not be inappropriate in meetings with women. What we're going to do is just keep women out of those meetings. What do you think of that solution? Does that sound like a good solution? No, it's, it's horrible. Because what does that do? It actually reinforces the problem and leaves the actual problem you know, unaddressed. So that sort of mentality of, you know, we'll just stay away. It reinforces this idea that women and their bodies are the issue. That their body is the problem. That they are temptresses. And men, it's just normal that men are hypersexual and can't control themselves. Is that true? No. Men can't control themselves. The issue is they don't often want to. That's the issue. It's the issue is accountability. And so we're reinforcing these, you know, awful ideas of that a lot of us learn in purity culture. And it's unjust to women, right? It's punishing the women who are the victims of the situation. Men bearing no cost for their lack of ability to have self-control. And so women are bearing the cost because men are refusing to be accountable. That doesn't sound like a good solution to me at all. Uh, what's the basic expectation of respect among people in the workplace or at church, among adults? Um, you know, I get questions sometimes. Well, I don't even know how to be a man in 2019. Um, you know, I'm worried people are going to take things out of context. Well, are, are you not able to keep your hands to yourself? That's something a child should know. <laughs> Children learn how to keep their hands to themselves and how to speak with respect to others. That's something that children learn. The problem is you're acting like a child, and you're not accountable. So don't turn the conversation in that direction. It's actually really easy to work alongside people and show them respect, and interact with people and show them respect, and how you treat them. And if, you, know, you can simply ask if you don't know if it's appropriate. Can I give you a hug? Is that okay? And respect their answer, and not to bring up you know, certain creepy conversation. It's really actually very easy. So I have, I have really very little patience for those questions um, from men. So, um, yeah, sorry, end of sermon. All right. 
We have to have the courage to hold offenders accountable. And again, in many of our churches, especially in churches with all male leadership, this amounts to men having the courage to step up and hold other men accountable. And often men have failed. And so let's hear from a courageous survivor, Rachel Denhollander. Her book's out, two of her books are out there. Please get it. Uh, read her story. She's a champion. And many of our women are leading on these issues. And I applaud them. And I applaud you. But we need more men to speak up and more men to join in. Because this affects every one of us. So Rachel says this. This was in a Christianity Today interview that she did uh, a couple years ago. She says, what happens when it's a trusted person at this church? What happens when it's a trusted person in these other evangelical organizations? The extent to which one is willing to speak out against their own community is the bright line test for how much they care and how much they understand. We have failed abhorrently as Christians when it comes to that test. We are very happy to use sexual assault as a convenient whipping block when it's outside our community. When the Penn State scandal broke, prominent evangelical leaders were very, very quick to call for accountability, to call for change. But when it was within our own community, the immediate response was to vilify the victims or to say things were at, that at, were, were at times blatantly and demonstrably untrue about the organization and the leader of the organization. There was a complete refusal to engage with the evidence. It did not matter. So we have to have that courage and understand that dynamic. It's easy to be against abuse over there. It's hard to be against abuse in our own community. And we have to do the work of holding others accountable. All right, now what about forgiveness? Because we do believe in forgiveness. Well, we have to be careful. Um, this is what Jesus said. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. So step one, what do we do? Forgive? No, that's not step one. <laughs> it's very clear. There's rebuke. There's accountability. And then there's what? There is a wrestling with. Are they genuinely repentant? Well, here's the thing. Uh, a violent spouse, a child, a child abuser, a predatory pastor. They are very skilled at manipulating others and convincing them that they are repentant. They know the words to use that sound really convincing. But how do you know if they're actually repentant? That's the hard issue. And we have to be wise as serpents about that. So, what do we want to hear? Here's how you know. It's not that they say something spiritual. It's not, do they say, I'm so sorry. Are they taking full responsibility? Are they giving you any excuse, any minimization, any rationalization? Is there any blaming of the victim or anything else? The stress, the job, the marriage, the alcohol, why well, I said anger management issues. You know, abusers use anger in a very targeted way to declare. It's not an issue often with anger management. Are they, do they care about what happened to the victim? Do they acknowledge that at all? Or is it all about them? You have these narcissistic abusers. It's all about them, right? Even after they're caught. When, now I'm going to speak specifically, because the churches call us when they have a child sex offender who says, can I come to your church? Is that okay? They call us sometimes, and I say, well, one of the questions you need to ask is, do they think they're a danger to kids? Just ask them. What do they say? Oh, no, no, I would never do that again. Well, now you know you're dealing with someone who's really dangerous. Someone who's repentant will know their danger and admit that and say, yes, I need accountability. They'll accept any consequences in accountability. They'll demonstrate not only with words but actions. And of course, a lot of that has to be done very, very carefully. We advise churches on this all the time. Uh, specifically for child sex offenders, any kind of minimization to non-excuses, um, they're not repentant. And they should not be around kids. And I'm not just talking about kids in the kids' ministry. I'm talking about they shouldn't be around kids in the hallway or wherever. So that's a tough thing, but it must be done. Now, reporting child abuse. Um, the key here is do it. Um, do it, and don't hesitate. Um, you'll have um, guidelines in your state, but every adult in Oklahoma is a mandated reporter. 
I train in states all over, and sometimes not everyone's a mandated reporter. In those states, I still tell every adult, if you're a Christian, you have a responsibility to speak up for those who are born. And so you should report, even if you're not mandated to, if you have any evidence, if you have a disclosure, or if you have a reasonable suspicion. Now, there's a lot of tools and resources that you can go to and get good examples of what that looks like. And of course, a lot of our training with churches and adults, we go through those issues extensively. We don't have time to today. Um, so we, as adults, have a moral obligation, not just a legal one. So we don't investigate child abuse ourselves. Don't do it. You don't have the tools to do it. Uh, take specific skills. Um, let someone who's professionally trained do it. And for adult abuse, if there is a violent incident happening now, you call what number? 911. Uh, if a, a woman says their husband was violent, and you know now it's obviously you're having coffee and that's not happening right now, do you simply just call the police at that moment? Um, no, don't. I could put her in greater danger. What you do with adult victims in those situations is you give them agency. And abuse agency is taken away. With adult victims, you give them back agency and you support them whatever their decisions. Some adults are not ready to come forward and report their abuse. And so you can connect them to the National Domestic Violence Hotline to find the local resources that can help support them. Uh, we don't have time to talk about what it might be to be an anchor for a woman who's in a domestic violence situation. But get Susan Brewster's book, Helping Her Get Free. Susan Brewster, Helping Her Get Free. That book is gold. It will tell you how to help and support a woman in that situation. And churches should have people trained to be able to do that. Uh, and how to be a help and not a hindrance in giving agency. All right, quickly, Matthew 18. Jesus said, if someone sins, you go to them first and handle it privately. Is that how we handle abuse? No, it doesn't work. Um, Jesus is talking about a relative uh, peer situation where the relative equal power and clearly he's talking about more minor types of sins, not crimes, right? Not those types of uh, insidious, egregious sins. He's not talking about a wolf in sheep situation. That is not the situation he's describing. Uh, <clears throat> and the more appropriate scripture to apply to that situation would be something like Psalm 82. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the weak. So uh, there's also a really good passage in Job that I like. Um, Job talks about how he sought out the one who was the people, the vulnerable people who were being victimized, and he <clears throat> broke the fang of the broke the fang of the unrighteous, the one who had grabbed the victim in his mouth. He says, "I I broke their fang and made them drop their prey." It's a beautiful image of rescue. Uh, that's the more appropriate. <laughs> scripture to apply when you're talking about child abuse in particular. And um, so, again, just be very careful as you apply scripture. Um, we see this all the time. And Jesus just was not teaching in this passage. If a little lamb is ravaged by a wolf, first step, send the little lamb back to the wolf. That's preposterous. It's not at all what he was teaching. All right. We're going to have some questions here for a few minutes. But... Humility is hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard to be humble. It's hard to be empathetic. It's hard to have courage. And so, again, don't take it all on yourself. This is something we need to own as communities. And in particular, leaders must make this a prominent matter for discipleship. I mean, what is discipleship? Walking in the light of Jesus, knowing God. How do we treat one another? I mean, those key issues, that's what we've been talking about today, right? This is what all Christians are called to. We're called out of darkness to walk in the light. And so Paul says it that way, right? Walk as children of light. Again, all that imagery comes from Jesus' statements, that he's the light of the world. And then Jesus said, not only am I the light of the world, he says, you, plural, we as Christians are the light of the world. And we're to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. We're not to ignore them. We're to be wise as serpents. We're to expose them. So let's end with one more word of encouragement. 
uh, Revelation 21 says it this way, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And I hold on to that verse from Isaiah 42 all the time. It says, The servant, Jesus, will not grow faint or be discouraged until he's established justice. So that's what we have to hold on to in doing this work. And I know many of you are doing this kind of work in many other areas, in your work uh, and, and so forth. So thank you for all you're doing already. If you wanted to reach out to me, my email is mike at netgrace.org. Um, I can tell you more about our program for churches, the certification program, where we go through these deeper cultural issues and take a more thorough approach to educating everyone in the congregation. Uh, if you're here from another church, we'd be glad to talk to you about that. All right, self-care, self-care, self-care. Don't go read a book on abuse. Don't watch a dark documentary about abuse. Don't do it. Take time, go for a walk. Spend time with your loved ones, your friends, and do something that's refreshing and rejuvenating. All right, what questions do you want to ask? Yes? Does your organization help churches write policies? Yes. So I will um, encourage you, if you go to our website, netgrace.org, again, we've been around since 2004, when the internet was younger. So we're at net, netgrace.org. Uh, we have books that we've developed ourselves. One of them is a full book-length policy guide. And then in addition to that, we also consult, provide consulting services in helping churches develop policy. Now, what we don't do is say, here's your policy, just do that. Because that doesn't work. It skips what we talked about earlier, which is, you have to own it and contextualize it in your own church. So we support you in that. We help you. We get creative with giving, okay, we have the children's church do this. How are we going to have the bathroom procedure and account for this and that? We consult with churches on that all the time. But at a, at a minimum, some churches can't afford that, and we get that too. Um, you know, we're trying to help in any way we can. But our policy book is a really good um, Resource, it's called the Child Safeguarding Policy Guide for Churches and Ministries. <laughs> and Baz Basil Chavijan and Shira Berkovitz are the co-authors. Baz Chavijan is our executive director. Yes? You talked about how important it is for the community to own this issue. I wholeheartedly agree. So what do you say to those members of your community who don't believe all the statistics or who deny that it's a problem? Yeah. You have to just be willing to walk into those conversations uh, one at a time often. Now, I think the more strategic approach is to engage your leaders to address more people at once. <laughs> and so that's why, you know, um, that's why so many leaders, they have that, their responsibility level is, is way up here. Because they can stand up in front of the whole church and say, hey, I know not all of you could make it to that thing we, the event we did on abuse, but we put it online. And what I'm challenging you to do as your pastor is to, to the next two weeks, sit down for, you know, maybe take an hour at a time and watch through that. Um, I think that's maybe your more, I mean, I, I think you have to be willing to do both. If you get a friend or bring something up, you know, push back and say, yeah, okay, <laughs> And, and I help churches with this all the time. One, one, one pastor I know, he said, yeah, after I gave that statistic in my sermon, a guy came up to me and said, actually, that's an old statistic. And it's not one in four women, one in six men. It's this and this and this. And the pastor said, okay, where did you get that statistic that you're using? And the guy didn't have any way. He had just heard from someone <coughs> that one in four in one in six is like this old statistic from the psychologist, wherever, wherever. It's like, no, there's literally dozens of studies that bring back these rates. Um, it's well established. So I think personal conversation, but you've got to be strategic and go to your leaders and say, 
where's your heart? And you've got to you know, take that verse, take some of those verses to him and say, that's your job. That's your job as a shepherd. Other questions? Yes. Speaking of those references, do you have a list of scripture references that you can share or is it on your website? I haven't found it. No. Um, I will I would be willing to share a PDF of the slides with those who are present here today. I would I would I would um, I'll be glad to do that. Um, I took a picture of them all. There you go. <laughs> um, so what I ask of you is simply not to think that, oh, I can now do this training myself. Um, you need more expertise than that. It's like, you know, you know enough to do, do some harm. But you know, it's like uh, first day of medical school. You know, OK, let's do surgery. Let's, let's just try it out. Um, or when you get to seminary, the joke is, you know enough Greek to be dangerous. Um, so yeah, no, I, for your own personal study and reference, I'd be glad to, to share that with you. So, Kara is your point person for that. So make sure if you're from another church or you're here from this church, make sure before you leave you get your email to her. Does that sound okay? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we do. It kind of is a follow up to your question. Mm -hmm. I, I would love to put all this on the leaders. <laughs> the reality is, we're going to run into people in the hall tomorrow and throughout the week. To say, oh, what did you find out? What do you mean? What, how do we get in two sentences conversation started mm -hmm. the way you need it started? Sure. Mm -hmm. One of the most effective ways I start conversations is uh, the other day, a few months ago, I, I looked at a pastor and said, well, you know the Bible talks about abuse all the time, right? And he said, really? Yeah, it does. And maybe that intrigues them. You say, because there's so, so many people have this mentality of, well, of course we have to have a policy. It's 2019. Of course we have to have a seminar on this. People are tweeting about church too. Well, yes, good. I'm glad for those things. However, what needs to drive what we're doing? You know, essentially, in addition to the, you know, the way I structured this today with humility and courage, all of that is straight from the Bible. It's driven by God and who He is. He is a God who thinks of other people, <coughs> and cares for other people. And if we miss this, we've missed God. I mean, that's I don't know how to say it any other way. And so I would say, do you know God? And you need to know and learn about these things. There's a verse in Jeremiah. Uh, it's not in this presentation. Uh, I'll find a reference for you if, if you ask me. Give me a second. Um, I'll, I'll look it up. But it's calling out the leaders of that day, which the leaders of that day were not good leaders, right? Um, that was the whole reason for the, the exile and um, judgment. And um, so God is calling them. And it's all the same dynamics we talked about. They are preying upon the people themselves and using their leadership, using their position to exploit people. Uh, they're heaping up oppression upon oppression, Jeremiah says, deceit upon deceit. And Jeremiah, as God's mouthpiece, is being used by God to call them to account for it. And then there's a verse that says, hey, remember Josiah a few generations ago? He was a really good king. What did he do? He defended the rights of the poor and the needy. He defended the vulnerable. And then Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah says, is this not what it means to know me? Like, do you know God or not? Do you care about abuse? Do you care about victims? Do you know God? That's the real question. Do our pastors know God? <laughs> do, our, do our people in our churches know God? Um, do we know God? Do I know God? That's a question. Other questions? Can you give us an example of um, open-ended questions? Sure. For, not just for kids, but even for adults. <clears throat> that, that, yeah. that is giving them agency without being leading. 
Yeah. So let's say you're having coffee with a friend, and you know she says or he says, let's say she says, um, "Yeah, I didn't think I could come." You know, Jim gets really annoyed when I go out. Well, okay. Many spouses who are abusers work to isolate their wives or, or partners from going out and seeing other people. Okay, so if you get any kind of inkling of something's off, something's wrong, it, even if you're not suspecting abuse at that point, just to say, oh, I'm sorry, and just to say, well, so she said, he gets annoyed. So the open-ended question is, what do, you, what do you mean he gets annoyed? Like, that's, that's, a, that's a good question to ask, right? Um, or you get a kid, like, hey, Johnny, it's time to go to church. We're going to be late. Can anyone, can anyone relate to this story? Um, I have five kids. I can relate to this story. Um, I don't want to go. Okay, many of us are just going to kind of put a foot down and say, hey, <laughs> leverage our authority. It's time to go. Instead of, I don't want to go, give some space and just say, what's going on? Um, many of these disclosures begin with, I don't want to go, I don't like, I don't like that place, I don't like that person. They're not, that's, um, disclosures talk, we talk about it, experts talk about it as a process, not a moment. So if you get any kind of inkling of discomfort or, you know, something's off, just say, what's going on? What happened? Those are good open-ended questions. And make space. And if you're late to church one Sunday, as a former pastor, I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's okay. It's fine. Uh, we have to be willing to have, you know, empathy and emotional intelligence in what our kids are experiencing and going through. And same with friends, right? So, other questions. Yes. In the same vein, what are some examples of really horrible leading questions? If a kid comes to us yeah. and discloses, how can we mess that up? Yeah, so don't say, <laughs> don't say, was it Bob who did to you? Was it Susan? Uh, did they touch you there? Did they touch you there? I mean, don't, don't say those things. Um, just say, um, it's okay to tell me more if you want to. What, what else happened? Or what happened next? You know, something like that is fine. Just don't ask about, did this direct, don't name something like specific, specific types of abuse, specific types of touching. Um, that's going to make it much harder for the forensic interviewer. And it's going to be much harder to hold anyone accountable who needs to be held accountable. So. In that situation, how do you yeah. get the ball rolling for a forensic interview to take place? Do you recommend making a call to the hotline, talking to the parents? How does that happen from talking to a Sunday school teacher to forensic interview? Yes, yeah, so every, um, every state has a reporting procedure, so it should be at every church's policy. Here's the number for CPS, or whatever you call it in Oklahoma. What do you call it? DHS. Yeah, yeah DHS. Uh, so you just call them if it's a child. Um, now, if you, know, if you think a child's like an immediate danger, calling the police is okay too. I mean, just usually, there's much better communication nowadays between CPS and law enforcement, and and, you know, it's not wrong to just call your local police department. It's okay. Um, but, you know, in, in many states, they're going to communicate with each other. But, yeah, just call the local number for CPS. Many states have hotlines that will connect you to them uh, 24 hours. Um, you can, if, if the local office is closed, you can call them 24 hours. I don't know if Oklahoma has one or not. But, yeah, so that you just Google the number. Um, child hotline, Oklahoma, there it is. Uh, put it in your phone though, so you just have it. All right, thanks. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you so much, Mike. We have really appreciated your leadership and your teaching today. Um, I know we're going to have a lot to think about, not today, because we're not today. Still here, <laughs> but um, in the days and weeks ahead, and, and also we've got some good action points. Um, and um, talk to the staff. Tell them that you know this is something you want to see, and we'll we'll get the ball rolling.